apologise to the world, but uh, possibly the reasons we are aware of Guernica is not necessarily because of what happened, it's probably because of uh, Pablo Picasso's uh, famous painting. But Guernica has far, a far greater legacy than that. 80 years ago next Wednesday, um, 80 years ago next Wednesday, the Condor Legion, um, and Enda's going to explain the exact details, bombed, was one of the, when they bombed Guernica, it was one of the first civilian uh, tar it was one of the first targets of civilians in area bombardment, and that has haunted the world since then. If you pick up a newspaper, you're going to read, be able to read stories, whether it's in Syria, Afghanistan, or all across the world, of ver very similar events to Guernica. For the Basque people, um, in many ways, Guernica started what has been 80 years of repression, first under General Franco, and then under uh, after Franco fell, right up to today, the Basque people have been uh, suffering repression, and Guernica in many ways has come to symbolise certainly the beginning of that. Um, over this weekend we've organised a range of events, so tonight uh, the Megaria historian is going to talk about the events of Guernica. Uh, Bernadette Kalski will be sitting here. Mm -hmm. uh, she's going to launch a magazine uh, which we've brought out to mark these events, and that's available at the back of the hall for five euros. But now, uh, tonight, we're going to hand you over to Enda. Enda's a on post worker, a member of the Communications Workers Union, and a Spanish Civil War historian. His talk will last for about 30 35 minutes, and he's going to explain exactly what happened in Guernica in April 1937. Evening, folks. All right, I'd just like to start by giving you a little background on the war in the Basque country and the events that led up to the horrific bombing of Guernica on April 26, 1937. Now, by the start of April of that year, the Spanish Civil War had now raged for nearly nine months. And for most of that time, the Basques, along with Santander and Asturias, had held out, cut off from the rest of Republican Spain. Basque Republican resistance had not, of course, been entirely successful. Navarre had been swamped by the general's coup in July of 36. Alava, too, had fallen early. But Vizcaya and Capuqua defeated the initial coup, thanks to a mass mobilization of Republicans and the left, spearheaded by the Basque Nationalist Party. This was despite the fears of the Madrid government that these conservative Catholics might actually support the right-wing insurrection. The commander of the forces, forces arrayed against the Basque Republicans was General Emilio Mola, based in Pamplona. A white terror descended on the areas controlled by him. Thousands of Republicans were executed. The primary motivation for this was to subjugate the population through terror. At a meeting of mayors from the district surrounding Pamplona on July 19, 1936, Mola had declared, it is necessary to spread an atmosphere of terror. We have to create the impression of mastery. Anyone who is overtly or secretly a supporter of the popular front must be shot. Well, Mola certainly did an awful lot of shooting. Despite the fact that there was little real fighting involved in his seizure of Navarre and Alava, by July 29, 1936, according to his own secretary, he was close to despair, even suicide, as he was down to just a mere 26,000 rounds of ammunition for his entire so-called Army of the North. But then, Nazi German and fascist Italian planes flew him in 600,000 cartridges. This had been arranged by General Francisco Franco, who Mola later met at Seville on August 13, 1936. At this meeting, Mola agreed to launch a campaign to capture Arun and San Sebastian with the strategic aim of cutting off the Basques from the French border. Arun and San Sebastian began to be bombed daily. Nazi Junker Ju-52s were prominent among the attackers. San Sebastian was also bombarded by naval gunfire. On August 26, 1936, the ground assault on a run began. This was commanded by Colonel Alfonso Bjorn a ruthless underling of Mola's. 
He was heavily supported with artillery and also had at his disposal a small number of Nazi Panzer Mark I tanks. Day after day, Arun's defensive lines were hit by prolonged artillery bombardment that would force the Basque militias to withdraw from their frontline positions. Periodically, the bombardment would lift and an enemy infantry assault would go in. The Basques would then counter-attack and in hand-to-hand -hand fighting, drive back the assault. At this point, the artillery would start up again and the cycle repeat. That was the pattern of the fighting, the terrible, terrible pattern, very reminiscent of World War I. The Pulsa Ridge, for example, was devastated by artillery, evacuated, lost to the enemy, counter-attacked, and retaken four times in this way before finally falling to Berlegi on September 2nd. At this point, the inhabitants of Arun began to flee across the international bridge to Hendaya, impelled by panic, many in tears, and penniless. With their families safe, the militias, who had fought with such skill and bravery for so long against an enemy with so much, now too began to withdraw across the frontier. A detachment of anarchists and one of communists stayed last. The former set several parts of a run ablaze to deny material to the enemy and also shot some of the worst anti-Republican prisoners in Fort Guadalupe, leaving the rest free to cheer Bjorlegi as he occupied the ruined town on September 4th. Bjorlegi did not live long to savour his victory. He suffered a mortal wound in the leg in the closing engagement of the battle, shot at the international bridge by French communists who had come to help their Basque comrades. Mola's Gaputra campaign rolled on. On September 13th, the local Basque Nationalist Party dominated defence committee surrendered San Sebastian without a fight, not wanting their beautiful city to be destroyed. Not surprisingly, the local anarchists saw this as cowardice at best, if not outright treason. There was fighting, with the anarchists being suppressed and driven out of the city. Meanwhile, anti-Republican prisoners were protected and released. The surrender of the city and the handing over of the prisoners unharmed got the San Sebastians no favours from Mola. He arrived with a blacklist of Basque nationalists and left-wingers. Those on it, or their relatives if they were absent, were rounded up and sent off to Pamplona to be imprisoned and shot. This disgraceful capitulation of San Sebastian left all of Gipruqua in Mola's hands. Thus, only Vizcaya was free when the Republican Cortes approved the statute of Basque autonomy. Jose Antonio Aguirre pledged the new Basque Republic, to be known as Euskadi, to stand by the government of Madrid until the defeat of fascism. On October 7th, municipal councillors from all over the Basque who could attend voted in Guernica for the presidency of the provisional government of Euskadi. Aguirre was elected. He then named his cabinet, which was sworn in under the ancient oak tree. The Basques at this stage got a break from enemy offensive activity, as the main focus of the war shifted to a concerted effort by Franco to take Madrid. But this did not mean things were easy. Surrounded by land, blockaded by sea, and with agriculture disrupted by war, there was much suffering from hunger. I'll just get a drink. <laughs> On January 4, 1937, Bilbao was bombed by JU-52s of the Nazi Condor Legion. Two of the attacking aircraft were brought down by Russian fighters. One German who bailed out was beaten to death by the enraged civilians that he landed amongst. This incident has been cited by some as a motivation for the Guernica attack over three months later. This strikes me as unlikely, the launching of such an expensive operation as Guernica in terms of aviation fuel and ordnance would have to have had a more worthwhile purpose in the minds of Luftwaffe staff than simple revenge for the killing of a single man by angry civilians whom he had just bombed. It should also be mentioned that a second German managed to bail out on the fort. 
He too was nearly killed by civilians, but was lucky. A Russian pilot on furlough was close by where he landed, and in an extraordinary example of the extension of a professional courtesy, he weighed in and rescued him and marched him off to captivity at pistol point. Perhaps this act might have dampened Luftwaffe fear or Luftwaffe anger over the first man. Perhaps it's of no matter. They, they had no be nice to the Basque plans in any case. On March 22, 1937, Franco put new plans uh, to his air chief, General Alfredo Kindelin. The Madrid front would be reorganized defensively. Mola would embark on a campaign to finish off the Basques. Kindelin would render onto him all support deemed necessary. On March 31st, Mola's offensive broke. He issued a statement. I have decided to terminate rapidly the war in the north. Those not guilty of assassination and who surrender their arms will have their lives and property spared. But its submission is not immediate. I will raise all Vizcaya to the ground. On this day, the Condor Legion's JU-52s flying from Vitoria bombed the town of Durango, an important rail, road and railway junction between Bilbao and the front. 127 civilians, including 13 nuns and two priests, were killed outright, and 121 more died later in hospitals from their injuries and wounds. The same day, after heavy and well-coordinated air and artillery bombardment, the battle for Ochandio began. 40 to 50 aircraft bombed the town each day. By April 4th, Mola's forces nearly had the place surrounded. Terrified of being cut off and thus falling alive into the hands of a merciless enemy, the Basques withdrew, leaving 600 dead behind them. After April 4th, there was a pause in operations due to heavy rain, but Moa's offensive started up again with renewed vigour on April 20th. Supported by artillery and aerial bombardment, his troops, despite many incidences of stout resistance, drove back the Basques. Defensive positions that were not reduced were bypassed and outflanked. The Basques would then retreat in fear of being surrounded and cut off. Constant bombing blocked the roads and prevented the movement of Basque forces. An atmosphere of panic arose and persisted. Many Basque soldiers just wanted to get back to the Ring of Iron, the defences around Bilbao. General defeat for the Basques seemed imminent six days after the renewal of Mola's offensive. It was at this stage that the infamous destruction of Guernica took place. Guernica in 1937 was a town with a population of 7,000, but on the afternoon of Monday, April 26th, it was crowded with thousands of refugees and retreating soldiers. It was also market day, and although the Basque government had ordered a general halt to such events, many farmers had come in with their cattle and sheep. The front lay roughly 10 kilometres away at this time. At 16.30 hours, church bells announced an air raid. There had been air raids in the area before, but Guernica had only been lightly affected. The town had no air defence of any kind. As many people as could headed down into the cellars, which had been designated as air raid shelters. At 16.40 hours, a single Heiko HE-111 of the Condor Legion's experimental bombing squadron appeared over the town. It was piloted by a Major von Moreau. The HE-111 was a new fast twin-engine bomber capable of carrying 2,000 kilos of bombs. At this time, only four were operational with the Condor Legion. Moreau dropped his 2,000 kilos of bombs on the town centre and then flew off. Most people came out of the shelters at this point, many going to help the injured. But 15 minutes later, Moreau was back, guiding in the three other HE-111s of the Heinkel flight of Experimental Bombing Squadron 88. They flew over the town centre, dropping various sizes of bombs. 
People who rushed back into the shelters were choked by smoke and dust. Panic spread as it was realized the shelters were not strong enough to withstand the heavier bombs and offered no protection from fire. A stampede into the fields around the town began. There were 10 Heinkel HE-51 biplane fighters on, uh, on station escorting the bombers. These aircraft from Hunting Group 88 now swept down, raking everyone they saw with machine gun fire. Some pilots even dropped hand grenades from their cockpits. Men, women, including nuns from the local hospital, children and livestock were butchered. And the awful thing was, this was only the beginning. The main part of the attack hadn't even started yet. This was carried out by the three bomber squadrons of Battle Group 88, commanded by Leutnants von Knauer, von Boos and von Kraft, an aristocratic bunch. The squadrons were not at full strength and came to 23 aircraft in total. At 17.50 hours, the heavy sound of aero engines from the first of these aircraft was heard in Guernica. The more experienced soldiers identified them as trams, uh, their nickname for the ponderous trimotor JU-52. These aircraft, flying from Burgess, carpet-bombed Guernica systematically in 20-minute relays for two and a half hours. They came in in flights of three, flying abreast, giving them an attack frontage of 150 meters. They dropped 22 metric tons of ordnance on Guernica. The mix was very nasty, comprising of high explosive, shrapnel, and incendiary devices. A squadron of fascist Italian CR-32 fighters under a Captain Corrado Ricci was providing escort, along with a flight of new state-of-the-art Messerschmitt BF-109 fighters. These knights of the firmament covered themselves in martial glory once more as helpless, defenseless people were strafed, attempting to flee the town. Some fascist Savoyo Marchetti 79 bombers joined the last stages of the attack. Whole families were buried in the ruins of their houses. The improvised bomb sheltered cellars offered little protection. Even a hardy purpose built shelter offers little protection from incendiary bombs. If the flames and smoke don't kill the occupants, the oxygen being burned up ensures they suffocate. The purpose of incendiary bombs is often cited as being target markers. The real purpose often is to ensure a 100% body count in a designated target area. The scenes in Guernica were hellish. Cattle and sheep blazing with termites and white frost, phosphorus ran crazily among the burning buildings until they died. Fire blackened humans staggered through the flames, smoke and dust, while others tore the rubble, desperately trying to help friends and family. The centre of Guernica was an inferno. The vast parliament house and the famous oak tree lying away from the centre uh, remained untouched. So was the arms factory outside the town and the oft-mentioned Renteria Bridge. The British Council uh, in Bilbao, R.J. Stevenson, went to view Guernica the next day. This is an extract uh, from the letter that he wrote to Sir Henry Chilton, the uh, British ambassador in Madrid. On landing at Bermeo yesterday, I was told about the destruction of Guernica. I went at once to have a look at the place and to my amazement found that the township, not only of some 5,000 inhabitants, since the September influx of refugees, about 10,000, was almost completely destroyed. Nine houses in ten are beyond reconstruction. Many were still burning and fresh fires were breaking out here and there, the result of incendiary bombs, which owing to some fault, had not exploded on impact the day before, but were doing so at the time of my visit, under falling beams and masonry. The casualties cannot be ascertained, and probably never will be accurately, some estimates put the figure at 1,000 
Others at over 3,000. The British journalist George Steer, correspondent for the Times, also viewed the horrors of Guernica. He estimated that between 800 to 3,000 people died. A report in Russian archives gives a record of 800 dead, uh, though this does not take account of people who died after the date of the attack from injuries sustained, or those missing whose bodies were later or never found. This report, dated May 1st, 1937, is a secret military one, clinically interested in the effects of carpet bombing, a subject of some interest to the Kremlin. The Soviet Union was the only country in the world at this time maintaining a fleet of strategic heavy bombers. Thus, this report is widely regarded as being politically objective. The Basque government reported 1,654 dead and 889 wounded. The Francoist figures are ridiculously low and range from 300 to the extreme low of 12. Yes, right from the immediate aftermath of the attack, the Francoists lie. They told giant skyscrapers of lies. Lies with flipping great big cathedral bells hanging off them. Uh, one example would be Franco's GHQ issued a statement. We wish to tell the world loudly and clearly a little about the burning of Guernica. Guernica was destroyed by fire and petrol. The red hordes in the criminal service of Aguirre burnt it the route to ruins. The fire took place yesterday, and Aguirre, since he is a common criminal, has uttered the infamous lie of attributing this atrocity to our noble and heroic air force. The Spanish church backed this story up completely, and its professor of theology in Rome went so far as to declare, the truth is, there is not a single German in Spain. Franco only needs Spanish soldiers, which are second to none in the world. On April 29th, Guernica fell to General Salcago's Navarrese division. Foreign journalists accompanying him were told that quite a few bomb fragments had been found in Guernica. The damage had been mainly done by red incendiarists in order to inspire indignation. It was later claimed the town had actually been bombed by Republican aircraft. The bombs, it said, were shown to have been manufactured in Basque Nationalist territory and the larger explosions caused by dynamite in the sewers. One has to ask, why the big lies? There was little hope of convincing Spanish Republicans of their validity or any straight-thinking uh, foreign public. The fact is, um, and that's particularly the case considering the respectable diplomats and uh, journalists that attest to, to the truth. The fact is that the lies were more for Franco's own soldiers than anyone else. In particular here we're thinking of the Carlos. Guernica was, after all, a sacred place uh, for these uh, reactionary arch-conservative monarchists. Uh, their militia, the Riquete, supplied Franco with some of his best troops. He could not provoke their wrath by admitting to such a terrible like uh, violation of their spiritual center. Actually, there's no evidence to suggest that Franco actually ordered the bombing. He was a man who could delegate after all. He'd given Mola a job to do in the north and the resources to see it done. His own attention was on another front at this time, that being a political one. He was smashing the old shirt leadership of the Falange and emasculating that organization into a more domesticated political animal more suited to his needs. Um, as regards Mola, it has to be said, it's hard to imagine him authorizing such an attack on Guernica. He was very close to the Carlos. Uh, during his time as military commander in Pamplona before the war, he'd embraced them and they him. He knew what Guernica meant to them, and given his area of operations was specifically more reliant on their riquetes than Franco was generally. But Mola was the field commander on this front, it has to be pointed out. Yes, but he was no expert in aerial warfare, and generally allowed his foreign specialists, principally the Luftwaffe component of the Condor Legion, a degree of freedom in operational deployment. 
But of course there was contact and communication. Mola required for his army to be properly supported from the air. He required certain missions to be carried out to support his assaults and offensives. This contact and communication point was Colonel Juan Vigan, Chief of Staff of the Army of the North. Operation Rugen, the code name given to the Nazi attack on Guernica, was planned by Rick Tobin, but he did discuss it with Vigan. Both conferred on the 25th and the 26th of April about it, without reference to higher authority. So the record shows. It seems likely that Rick Tobin would have disguised his full intentions from Vigan, as Vigan would surely have objected. Apart from careless sensitivities being an issue, there would have been the unnecessary destruction of property that the Francoists would have coveted. Franco, after all, wanted to possess Spain, and while he had no problem killing hundreds of thousands of people to do it, he generally wanted the real estate, infrastructure, and industry as intact as possible. Thus, from a Nazi point of view, his forces seemed sometimes to pull their punches. The Nazis had had this out with the Francoists before, so Rick Tobin would have known not to reveal what he really planned. Nothing like Guernica had ever happened before. This was not an aerial attack to destroy enemy tactical units on the battlefield. This was not aerial bombardment to reduce defensive positions. This was not harassment and interdiction, bombing and strafing to cut an opposing army's supply and communications. This was the whole-scale destruction of an innocent town in a vulgar display of power to inflict death, injury, terror and misery in order to demoralize an entire people and rob them of their will to resist. This was a disgusting experiment by Wolfram von Richthofen to assess the validity of the theory of strategic terror bombing. Two things I feel it's necessary to state at this time. I do not accept any circumstances in which the bombing of Guernica could be regarded as a legitimate act of war. Franco's whole war against the Republic was illegitimate, both legally and morally. Malum prohibitum et malum in se, as they say in legal circles. Also, I don't mean to exonerate Franco, Mola, and Vigan here. Guernica was a multi-act tragedy. They and their like directed every single act, except for the finale. The finale, that was Rick Tobin's. Rick Tobin would later claim, and his apologists have claimed ever since, that the whole business of Guernica was a tragic accident. It is said they were merely trying to destroy the Renteria Bridge, but bad visibility due to smoke and strong wind caused the bombs to drop on the town. This is nonsense. Apart from the fact that the smoke was the result of fires started by Nazi incendiary bombs and there was no strong wind, the idea that Richthofen was trying for the bridge is ridiculous on three levels of military thinking. The strategic aim of Mola's army was Bilbao or bust. Take the city in a rapid advance and knock the whole northern front out of the war. They were not engaged in a field operation of limited objectives to cut off, envelop and destroy a portion of Basque Republican forces. They would have wanted the bridge intact. If anyone had wanted to blow up the Renteria Bridge, it would have been the retreating Republicans to help buy them some time. Von Richthofen did have his own agenda, but it was one to show how air power could aid rapid victory, not delay it by doing stupid things like blowing up bridges in the path of your own army's immediate access of advance. On the operational level, one has to ask, if the aim of Operation Rugen was the destruction of a stone bridge, why then did such a high proportion of the loads carried by the bombers consist of incendiary and shrapnel devices? This type of ordnance is useless against such a target, as indeed were the types of medium bomber assigned to the operation. The Heinkel HE 111 would be lucky to drop a bomb inside a circular target zone of 100 metres in diameter. 
As for the JU-52, well, I can't actually find any specifications on its bombing accuracy. But given the fact that it was primarily a transport and passenger plane being improvised as a bomber by slinging bombs under its fuselage, you can imagine just how bad it was. These aircraft were for area bombardment and lacked the tactical strike capabilities necessary for a precision target like a bridge. Now, it has been argued that Rick Tolvin possessed no aircraft of greater bombing accuracy, so was stuck with what he had. This, however, could not be more untrue. He had four Junkers Ju-87 Stukas. They sat down all day on the airfield at Burgos while Guernica was annihilated. Now, I know today the Stuka might seem like a bit of a joke, a lumbering, ugly old banger. But back then, it was the deadliest precision dive bomber in existence. No other dive bomber came close to it. It was in a class all its own. Many military aviation historians would argue, and you know, it still is. You take out modern communication, guidance, and computer technologies, and you'll still find no better aircraft than a Stuka for the precision delivery of free-falling dumb iron bombs and its bomb load was considerable for a single engine aircraft, 1,800 kilos. Yes, the Stuka wasn't fast, it wasn't pretty, it could not defend itself against attacking fighters, not an issue at all in the skies over Guernica, but it was very good at the job for which it had been primarily designed. It could consistently hammer bombs into a circular target zone of 10 meters in diameter. It was over 10 times more accurate than a HE-111. In short, a single Stuka pilot could have taken out the Renteria Bridge, blind or in his sleep. There was no need to send an entire escorted and reinforced medium bomber wing, unless, of course, the intention was for massive destruction to rain down on a designated area target. The tactics used by the Luftwaffe at Guernica also says something about their intent. As already mentioned, the bombers came in in flights of three, flying abreast, giving them an attack frontage of 150 metres. That's not how you bomb a bridge. That's how you cleave corridors of destruction over a wide area. If they'd been trying for the bridge, the approach would have been along a linear vector in a flight path directly over the bridge, taxi rank style. Also, without trying to be whimsical on such a grim matter, back then, as now, the machine gunning of helpless, hysterical people in open fields as they flee a town turned into an inferno was widely regarded as being worse than damn useless in the entire area of bridge demolition. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, this guy must be a leading light from the department for the statement of the flipping obvious or something, but the crazy thing is, all of this is still necessary. Sure, the absolutely ridiculous whopper lies told by the right have long since been dismissed, but the not-so-big lies, they still persist and are still uttered by right-wing historians today. These lies seek to minimize the death toll and disguise the intent of the Guernica attack. For example, this book here was published in 2006 by a very popular uh, British publisher specializing in military history. They're generally quite good, uh, but this one is uh, written by uh, an ex-Spanish army NCO. Uh, in the single paragraph it gives to the Guernica attack in the section devoted to Camp Group 88, um, it states, on the 26th of April 1937, during the operations to conquer the Basque provinces of the northwest coast, K-88, together with some Italian aircraft, attacked the small town of Guernica with devastating effect, killing many civilians. Contemporary claims of thousands of dead made in the international press on behalf of the popular front were exaggerated. The actual number has never been absolutely established, but is estimated at around 300 killed. Republican propaganda painted this as a pure terror attack. In reality, 
The town was a point on the route by which popular front forces were withdrawn, and Granica's river bridge was a legitimate military target. Nevertheless, while there was no intentional aim of causing civilian deaths, the apparent carelessness over them was undoubtedly the war's greatest propaganda gift to the popular front. What tripe! <laughs> And this isn't some far-right boot only available over the net and got from the likes of Vermont and Vermont or some shower like that. This passes as reasonable objective history put out by a major publisher like Osprey. It's 80, year, it's 80 years now since close on 2,000 people, maybe more, were murdered in the first strategic terror bombing operation in history. There were people as real as any of us here in this room tonight. They were killed for merely wanting to live in a society like the, the one we've been lucky enough to live in, though many dreamed of a far, far better one, and rightly so. It is only right that we should remember them this month, in the year of the 80th anniversary of their murder. It is sad we still have to argue the absolute guilt of their murderers.